We're uh, here aboard the USS Edson in Albany, New York, in the Port of Albany. And I'm here today with Richard Eberly, who served in the United States Navy from 1943 to 1946. That's correct. And uh, Rich, tell us um, why you enlisted and what ships you were on. Uh, well, let me, tell let me, me about enlistment first. Let me tell you a little story. Uh, I went to a list, enlist while I was a senior in high school, and I was just about to, uh, near graduation, I should say, and of course the war broke out, and I wanted to get into the service. Well, my friends were going, and I wanted to go very badly. So I went down to enlist, and lo and behold, I was told I have a hernia, and therefore I could not get into the service. So needless to say, uh, this did not make me very happy. And I went home, told my parents, and asked if they could borrow the money to have a hernia operation. Well, I wound up, they put me into the hospital. I had it done, and about six months later, I voluntarily enlisted in the Navy. I finally got my wish. So, from when you uh, when you went in, where did you uh, where did you start out? I started out in uh, well, I took my boot training in Sampson, New York, and uh, after boots, uh, that was about in, that was in November. And uh, after uh, it went through the whole winter winter period, and Samson and I don't know if you know that or not is very very cold up there. <laughs> well, after Boots was over and done with, uh, I then was sent to Boston uh, to to study water tendering and fire firemen and so on. So. To make one correction before I come back. We're aboard the USS Slater in the port of Albany. Um, Richie, the, uh, you mentioned that you went into school and you learned water tender. A water tender. What is that? That's uh, 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 boilers. Evidently, I was slated to, to go on to a, a uh, I didn't know it at the time, but a DE, and which, which had boilers and uh, which, uh, rather than diesel, such as the Slater is here. Uh, and my function there was to learn about the boiler, how to fire a boiler up, the maintenance of a boiler, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 um, my function was a check man. I used to do the, the, the valves, feed the water into the boiler, and, uh, and maintain pumps and things such as that. You mentioned uh, um, that you were slated to go to a DE. Tell, I, us, tell us what a DE is. A DE is is a um, a smaller destroyer, a destroyer of uh, and more maneuverable and faster in order to keep up with carriers and transports and things such as that. That was our function, escorting carriers, mainly the. Uh, the small aircraft carriers, which uh, were used to uh, not launch big offensive, but to be transported over to the to the battle areas. So you, you had a role of really protecting the the larger ships. That's correct. Um, okay, so when you got done with your training, then what happened? After the training, we uh, we were I suddenly came back to New York, went over to Newark, and we there found the USS Gilligan, which I was assigned to. It was commissioned in May, I believe, of 1940. Wait a minute, I gotta think of that now. 1944, that's correct, 1944. And uh, we went through the shakedown cruise up to Bath, Maine, out to Long Island Sound, 
and pretty much the covered in in the northeast, the uh, Long Island Sound, and so on, so that we could uh, learn to operate the ship. And then we came back to the to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and a lot of the uh, additional refurbishing was done at that particular time, and ready to embark for. I guess it was the Pacific. I wasn't aware of that at the time. I noticed that you have your Gilligan hat on. Yes. And I also noticed that it says plank owner. What's okay. a plank owner? Plank owner is a is a person who's on board when it's at commissioning. I commissioned the ship. I was one that helped commission the ship. So you were among its first crew. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, so where did we go from Brooklyn? <laughs> from Brooklyn, we went down to Norfolk. We spent a couple of days in Norfolk. We did a little bit more uh, shakedown experiences, did some gunnery experiences, came back to Norfolk, had a two or three days liberty, and then we were on our way. We started down south and out toward past Cuba, on around through Florida, and headed toward the Panama Canal. Went through the Panama Canal and wound up in San Diego. And then from San Diego, we headed out to Pearl Harbor, Hawaiian Islands. And we escorted a, a number of ships at that particular time, all that distance out across the ocean from the west coast to the Hawaiian Islands. Was there any, any did you encounter any uh, enemy ships action at that point no no it was it was a uh, smooth sailing except for the I should say smooth sailing it was uh, we had no encountered no action <laughs> <laughs> we did have some rough seas there for a while but uh, and, and dick before we get into you know probably some of the, the combat that your ship saw what was life like aboard the ship I mean you know we're 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 sitting here. The backdrop for you today is a bunch of racks here in uh, in chief's quarters. Uh, what was life like al aboard the ship? Well, just as you see, the hammocks that they're not really hammocks. They were revised from the old hammocks. These were pipe frames with canvas, and we had mattresses such as you see, and a pillow. And uh, I fortunately had one of the top sections, the top yeah. bunk which was fine because there's a lot more room on the top than there is in between the bottom and the, and the middle the middle uh, rack. Uh, another thing that was uh, very funny is, is when you get out in the, in the Pacific, it gets quite warm. And we had vent, I'm just looking for the vent, vent stacks here. They were vent pipes that used to come down through the overhead. And those would, and then they would discharge down at the bottom. That would be the air from the outside forced air being driven in. And, was, uh, was it stuffy though, down below? Oh, was sure it, it was, yeah. and very, very warm. It got warmer later on, but uh, the, uh, they used to, we used to take the guys in the top bunks, used to poke holes. Maybe I'm talking out of turn, but we poke holes in the top and make little vents so that you'd have a scoop <laughs> there and you'd get the first amount of air. You know? <laughs> the poor uh, guy in the bottom might be starved of some of the air. Um, how about, uh, how about chow on the ship? What was your food? Chow was like? always good. Yeah. I, I always enjoyed the chow, except there some things, sometimes uh, when you were in rough weather, you didn't have, you'd have sandwiches instead of hot meals. But generally the meals were good, always good. What about, uh, what was your work schedule like? Well, my work schedule, I'm, I, I'm a water tender, so I did my steaming watch on the check valves in the forward fire room. Uh, you four on and four off. And uh, I'm sorry, four on and eight off. Geez, I'm forgetting the times now. But in between that time that you're off, you would work cleaning bilges and, you know, maintenance, general maintenance in the, uh, in the fire room. That had to be pretty hot uncomfortable uh, duty, Yes, it no? was. It was. Many times it was very warm down there. You, you know, you'd walk down there and you, and just uh, uh, sure. 
you know, your, not your shorts, but uh, you'd be in your, your dungarees, but you'd you were never supposed to take your shirts off because if you did take your shirt off and you encountered a steam leak or something like that, you're talking about superheated steam in that area. And that 850 to some odd degrees at 410 pounds pressure. I'm trying to remember all these things, yeah. but uh, after 58 years, you know. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> um, Dick, you, so, so you went, uh, let's see, at last you were in the Pearl. Where'd you go from there? Pearl, we headed out to the Marshall Islands. I'm thinking of Minjuro. I can't remember all of the names. I, I just uh, uh, should have had t taken that with me, but I was just on a uh, reunion this past weekend, and, and uh, I met some of the guys that I hadn't seen in 58 years, but they gave us a lot of information, things that I wasn't even aware of sometimes down at, at below decks, you know. And they, uh, there was one sheet that uh, listed all of the islands. We were about, must have visited, and went through about almost 20 islands, to different all over the Pacific. And what was your role while you're in that area? Still um, escorting larger ships? Or? Yes, and uh, hunting subs, making sure that they weren't anywhere near. We chased them down. And we got out to Enduro, I believe it was, and we encountered a couple of uh, two-man submarines, Japanese two-man submarines, which we sunk. We chased them down, found them, hunted them out, and sunk them. What kind of armaments? Are, what? What kind of uh, armaments did your ship have on it? Depth charges and? Oh yeah, the armament that we had were roller rack. Big ash cans, depth charge ash cans, the K guns. There's eight K guns on either side, four on either side, port and starboard. And uh, in the front, in the forward portion of the uh, ship, at the bow, they had we had what they call hedgehogs, and they would shoot a pattern of charges out a distance of maybe a hundred feet or so, and. Uh, and they were they would spread out quite a bit, so they they had they were pretty, yeah. pretty effective. Um, so where'd you go from there? And well, let's let's put it this way. You, so you were there in the Pacific, and obviously you were there in the Pacific for quite a while. Um, what are some memorable experiences while you were there in the Pacific? Well, of course, the first real action that we had was, other than the subs was at, at the Philippine Islands. We headed to the Philippine Islands. And the invasion of Luzon, we were part of that, and we were escorting uh, troops and, and uh, ships. And at that, that's, at that particular time, uh, we encountered the first episode of kamikaze the uh, Japanese that uh, would fly into you or, uh, and use their plane and uh, themselves as, a hum as human bombs. And the idea not to catch the, the small ships, they wanted to get the, the big capital ships, the carriers and that kind of thing. But if you fired at them, which we did, we, that was our function, they would come in at you, you know. And. Uh, we didn't get hit. Fortunately, we didn't get hit in uh, in Leyte. But the further up into the Philippine Islands, we uh, the Luzon Island, a two-man Japanese Betty, about eight o'clock in the morning. No, less not eight o'clock. Six o'clock in the morning, came into us. That's a two-engine bomber, the biggest bomber that Japan had at that time. They came in through us with the sun behind them, the rising sun. That's where that comes from. And you, you know, your visibility is very poor at that particular time. Well, we fired. We were at general quarters, of course. We picked it up, I don't know, about two miles out on our radar. And it was coming in just low to the water and just kept coming. We pumped, I don't know how many shells went into it. 
40 millimeter shells, five inch guns. We have five inch 38s, and it was it was burning. It was uh, it was hit. I later on found out that well they they assumed that the pilot was dead, but it, its momentum was coming through. We didn't hit a vulnerable spot to to blow it up, and uh, it came in and hit us. Came in on the port side of the ship. I remember that, and just hit the aft end of the boat deck. And we had torpedo tubes, three torpedo tubes. Took the tubes off, took the, the director, the five-inch director, off the boat deck, which two men were in the director. One was a Bill Stewart, um, a gunnery officer, and the uh, the other one was, was a seaman who was the operator of the director himself. And wound up that taps. Can I speak now? Sure. You know what the taps is for? For probably this crew, this of these DE people that are on board, they members that they lost. So they're, they, <clears throat> yeah, there are visitors on board today, and I think that's probably that's, in that's what I'm saying. Their, yeah. their, uh, Can I hold off on this? And, yeah, let's hold a minute. We'll let Taps finish. Well, as I was saying, the uh, the gunnery officer and this young seaman were swept right off the deck and of course there was this uh, big ball of fire this whole thing was totally burned there were people on both sides port and starboard another friend of mine a fellow by the name of Carmen Lametta he was on on the starboard side on one of the K guns that was his function and it swept this ball of fire swept over onto him, over, and he fell to the to, to the deck. And the uh, the ball of fire, he was involved in that ball of fire. He also. So I let you go off with uh, yeah. stating that this friend of mine uh, also was wounded. Uh, he had a piece of, found out later on, he had a piece of shrapnel up in his shoulder. I never knew this, I just found this out some 58 years later, but that piece of shrapnel is still in his shoulder. They could not remove it, it was too close to the artery, so they just... They just built, you know, just let it be. Yeah. It, uh, it didn't drift anywhere or anything, and he's been walking around with that for all these years. So. But the unfortunate part of that was that there were some 13 that were killed on board. The torpedo men, uh, I can't remember all of the guys, but, but 13 were lost and 26 were severely burned. And they were all taken off. Well, let me let me just go back a bit. One of the other functions was that I was in a, at, at, in a repair party at that that particular time, and I was forward, and I saw the plane coming in. There was nothing that we do. If you have no function, you uh, at the particular time to stop this, you take cover. Well, then it happened so fast you did, didn't take cover. You just stood there. And this was my first real engagement. I'm 18 years old, and and uh, I'd never seen anything like this before, you know. But even at 18, you're gung ho. But uh, when you get your first taste of action, yeah. it it changes your whole outlook. But anyway, uh, if to get back to that, after we this we're engulfed in this flame, we immediately rushed hoses and put the fire out, got it out as quick as we could. And then afterward we had to fish the bodies out of the water, or those that were in the water, out, and bring them aboard. And Bill Stewart, 
the uh, gunnery officer, his legs were totally mangled, at, uh, and he was he was in the in the water for a couple of times. He was in the water for a, a few hours, along with the uh, and al along with the other. Am I okay? With the other the other uh, uh, victims. I just shut it any other way, okay? Uh, yeah, it's really a little blank there now. People back on board, uh, those that, that were still alive, and uh, as there was, as you can imagine, a lot of confusion. It's another thing I found out that. Uh, Bill Stewart, the engineering officer, uh, was brought up to the, uh, the captain's uh, the mess hall, the officer's mess hall. And I don't know if you know this or not, but the officer's mess hall also operates as a uh, an operating room. And they have big lights and these big medical lights, but. We had a pharmacist board, a pharmacist aboard that uh, we did not have doctors, but we had a pharmacist aboard that uh, uh, did all of the, all of the uh, uh, the medical work. Let's yeah. let's yeah. put it that way. And I it was my uh, what I found out that he was going to he wanted to remove this. Bill Stewart's leg, and the captain at that particular time, our, our captain's Captain Bull, who was a Mustang, came up from the ranks, said, "No, we'll not do that. He may have a better chance if he gets to a hospital ship." And it so be it. It turned out that way. He still has his leg, although it's it's banged up quite a bit, but he uh, he survived that. What a great story! Yeah, I, I just want, I had to bring that out because that's uh, that's important. Of course, all the other fellows were taken care of just as well and went to the to the hospital ship, and then yeah. we did not see them for chief squad. Well, anyway, the uh, after all of this confusion, after hours of this cleaning up and such, we find that we're uh, still floating and 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 maneuverable shape and nothing happened to the propulsion or anything such as that. The, uh, the keel was in good shape and we were on our way, but we had to go back to what they called uh, one of the repair stations. And uh, we tied alongside, in the repair station, we tied alongside of a repair ship. And they patched us up as best we could, the best they could. And we sent, they sent us back to Pearl Harbor. And uh, Pearl Harbor, we all had R&R uh, &R for uh, in Royal Hawaiian Hotel, the only big hotel on the island at that particular time. And the funny thing there is that my wife and I had just gone back to uh, Pearl Harbor. We, we went to Hawaii on our, our uh, 50th anniversary and uh, sure enough, the Royal Hawaiian is there, along with hundreds of others. And it's a, it's a real commercialized place now, but it's, it was wonderful to go through that whole scene all over again. Lots have changed, but uh, it was great to see that. Then. But anyway, we had finished. Uh, they repaired us. Put new guns on us. Put 40 millimeter. Took the the two the remains of the tubes, the torpedo tubes, which were lost. They were taken off. The base was taken off, and they um, installed 40 millimeter quad 40s on the in the boat deck aft where the the tubes were, and two twins. And again, we did not know what this was all about, but they were preparing us for. Kamikaze attacks. Evidently, that was information that was known 
at that particular time. So we were being set up for, fitted for as an aircraft, anti-aircraft uh, uh, destroyer escort. Uh, and after, I think it was about 30 days, we started, we headed out again. We went to Ulithi and we escorted uh, a number of carriers and small boats, small ships rather, and uh, maneuvered in around the various islands. And let me let me just take a breather now. So I, I, one thing I do remember very very much was. We, I think it was Ulithi that we were at, where we, I saw so many ships of all types. Some ships almost that you could walk across the ship to ship if it, it, with so many of them. And this was in preparation for the invasion of the Philippine Islands. Uh, I'm sorry. This is, was in preparation for Okinawa. We were getting ready to go go into Okinawa, and uh, I forget the date that we wound up there. But when we got into Okinawa, uh, everything was quiet f during the invasion for the first couple of days, and we had the assign. We were assigned to do picket duty, and picket duty was the. Destroyers would go out and destroyer escorts would cover 26, 30 miles out from where all the major capital ships would be. And uh, the idea of that was that we would encounter any of the oncoming kamikaze planes that were coming in. And sometimes they would come in at three, four hundred at a time. And always in the morning, early in the morning in sunrise and always in the af in the evening sunset they'd follow the sun in and follow the sun down as, as it was going down and that was our um, uh, time that we well we sh we sh our, our total record was we shot down seven japanese planes two Bettys, and Couple of Zeeks, and what else? And a, and a torpedo plane. And in that run, one of the runs, I don't know how many days that we were on the picket. We were on a total of, of 26 hours and uh, 26 days on picket patrol around Okinawa. And, and uh, one of those one of those days, toward the end, a torpedo bomber came in. And dropped its its torpedo. We fired at it. We didn't bring it down. We did bring it down when, on the opposite side, but it wound up dropping its torpedo. But fortunately, the torpedo never armed itself. Those the Japanese they have to make so many revolutions of the propeller in order that they arm the, the warhead. This did not. He dropped it too short. And it wound up just poking a hole and sticking inside of the the ship on the fourth side. And there we are. We pumped bilges and and transferred fuel and and water ballast so that the thing was sticking up at a, at an angle out of the water. And of course, we headed back to the uh, to Cramaretta, and that was that was an, another repair station in the in Okinawa area. And uh, they said, you don't come in here with that thing. You get rid of that first before. <laughs> <laughs> because all the capital ships are in well, this particular area. Sure. Wow. Did, did your ship get hit any other times? No, it was just those, those, those two, two times. More than but yeah. That one shot would have. Uh, Two-thirty. <laughs> That's it. Uh, but I, I, there was another thing too that I, on this reunion that I was just at, I didn't never knew this, but uh, and I was below decks at the particular time. I was standing at my cruising watch, and uh, I found out that 
we had we were had two torpedoes launched at us from a Jap sub. Uh, and what had happened, they, 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 we weren't aware of it. They only picked it up afterward. But suddenly, the captain veered between the two torpedoes. And they came down either side, port starboard side of us, and we went in between us. They, it went in between us. and we. Otherwise, this thing, I wouldn't be here talking to you now, or, nor would maybe the most of that crew. Yeah. Um, so how long were you there in the Pacific, Rich, and at what point did you come back? Well, after the Okinawa, when the war was, we found out the war was over, the Jap Japan surrendered, but there were a lot of Japanese out there that did not know that. They were still buried on the island somewhere. They was, we were bombarding while, while they're declaring that, that the, the war is over with. We would shell some of the islands because they were buried in, in holes and and, and caves and places like that. Uh, this wound up maybe a couple of months, and then uh, we were on a picket on a, tro a patrol, cruising with with a couple of barges in the Pacific, in the uh, around the Philippine Islands, and we encountered a hurricane. A, a, I'm sorry, a typhoon. And we went into the typhoon and out of that typhoon. And I tell you, I, I, I've seen it where carriers where the flight deck was rolled back on the carrier like a sardine can. But we bobbed and weaved and heaved and, and heaved literally, too. I mean, yeah. it was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, here, there. Now, here, there. Um, anything else memorable over in the Pacific, Rich, before you talk about coming back? Yes, uh, there was, there's two other occasions that, that are most memorable. The, uh, the time that we first crossed the international date line. Uh, you are a polywog. Uh, that's a polywog is somebody that has not crossed the international date line and there is an, an initiation that goes with that uh, because King Neptune comes aboard the ship. Uh, King Neptune is usually the biggest uh, person on board the ship and we happen to have a big heavy set chief electrician and he wears the crown and he has the sepulcher and he has he sits there in his briefs <laughs> And he's, his big belly is covered with grease, and you have to kiss his belly along with. <laughs> and then, after the after the initiation, you are then a shellback. <laughs> and uh, that was one. And also, when you go across the equator, you, there's another initiation which is, excuse me, very similar to that. Uh, we are both. I crossed both the uh, international date line and also the the equator about two or three times since. But uh, well, there you go. but so that's an experience I'll never forget. <laughs> that's great. So um, the war ended in the Pacific. Okay, the war was ended, and then just about in April, you wait. When the war was ended, we were waiting to go home, and we were waiting for them to fly the pennant. If you know what that the going home pennant. The, that flies from the highest ma high mast and there's a foot of pennant for every mem crew member aboard the ship. Really? We had 216 or something like that. So that was 216 feet long plus the 16 officers. I didn't know that. And it flies from the mast clear over the, the uh, Aft end. And, uh, now, is there a particular color for that pennant? Or? Yes, it's it's a uh, red, white, and blue type pennant with a, you know with the star and and so on. It, it's a it's a continuous thing that flies. And I didn't know that. One. I didn't know that, Rich. That's yeah. that's neat. We always waited for that thing to fly because that means we're going stateside.
And did it, fi it finally? Yes, flew? we did. In <laughs> April, we headed home. And I got to San Diego. Uh, we had our discharge briefings and exams and so on and so forth. And I was finally discharged on May 16, 1946. Oh, and I chose, oh, you had the opportunity to, to um, they had to transport you back to where you started out from. Uh, or you had the option to uh, take your, your pay, your severance pay, <laughs> and transportation pay, which was six cents a mile, about $180, and $144 mustering out pay, and I hitchhiked across the country. I and three other guys. <laughs> and uh, That's great. I wound up with the, one of the fellows that I sp spent most of my cruising watches with in Chicago. Stayed there with him for a day or two and then I hopped on a bus and that the final leg home to New York. Back, back home. What was it like getting home? Oh, it was great. <laughs> it was great. So, after the war, what did you do? Well, after the war, I, I went back to school. Well, I worked for Western Union Telegraph Company. Be just, be well, just before I, I left, during the time that I was undergoing that, I had to go, undergo that recovery period for that hernia operation. And uh, I went back with them. I was a draftsman. And... Uh, I went to night school. I went to Pratt, Brooklyn Pratt, for an associate's engineering degree. And I worked with Western Union for all, many, many years, all, over 30 years, some odd years. But fortunately, I was always in one of their military programs. And uh, I elevated myself, and finally I became a, a senior engineer. And I was in uh, uh, connected with NASA. We had a Western Union had a contract with NASA to communicate with the shuttle when the shuttle was going through all their, and also during the Cold War, uh, the uh, TDRSS program. That's what they called it: tracking data relay satellite system, where they put three satellites up in in space 23,000 miles above space ab above the earth and it's so s arranged so that or set so that it's geosynchronous to one spot on in the United States and that was Las Cruces and my function was a facilities engineer in Las Cruces during the design and into the the uh, first days of operation. Interesting. So you, you took advantage of the GI Bill? Yes, I did. That's great. Um, somewhere in there, you got married. Yes, in 1950, absolutely. I better, better mention that. <laughs> April, April 19th, 19, April 16th, 1950. I almost got it. <laughs> Where I married my, my lovely wife, Catherine. And uh, we have had two children, Keith and Mary Ellen. And uh, we now have one granddaughter, Dana, who just recently graduated from uh, Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. Phi Beta Kappa, which, which, yes, <laughs> absolutely. That's the way I f we we felt. We were completely awed by this. Um, incidentally, she's now working in the, in the AmeriCorps, which is a, a complement to the Peace Corps, I believe. So I, I just had to bring that point that, across. That's an important <laughs> point. Um, and you're now retired. I'm now retired. Yes. Um, but you're, you, I know you're associated with at least one veterans group. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm associated with, excuse me, the Dessel organization. Which is what, Richie? 
Destroyer Escorts uh, Association, uh, also the Historical Museum Association, which is the Slater. Uh, we're members of that, both my wife and myself. And my wife uh, and we belong to Cap Dessa, which is the chapter of Dessa, Albany, New York. Uh, my wife is a, uh, a member of the auxiliary, and she happens to be the sunshine lady now. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And we, we, we come up here where every, every third, the fourth Thursday of every month, uh, from May, from April until November. And, and you also went to a reunion you mentioned recently. Yes. Um, that was a reunion of what, Richie? The, that was a reunion of the USS Gilligan. And So tell me about the reunion you just went to. Well, this past uh, weekend, in fact it started on Friday, uh, we went up to uh, Niagara Falls and, and visited, we had, how many did we have? Uh, 19. 19. 19 uh, people, uh, including, uh, that would be nine crew members and, and uh, their wives and, and a few guests. And, and plank owners? Any plank owners? Yes, they were all plank owners. All plank. They were all plank owners. And I and another fella have been on this uh, gathering this the people for this you know to come up with the names for the people for this reunion for the last almost eight months uh, finding addresses and names you know you, you, you have to have if you have names that's one thing but you got to have the addresses that go with it and then that does doesn't ensure that those people are still at that address yeah. and of course we found quite a few at deceased, you know, yeah. with deceased and so on. So, but any, the, anyway, the culmination of it was that uh, we had this, this three-day reunion in Niagara Falls, and it was wonderful. Amazing. And I met my old engineering officer, which uh, I was very pleased to, and I meet again, sure. found out that he has cancer and had a recent operation and uh, fortunately, they, they say it's cured now, or, or it will be. He's still under treatment, but uh, sure. he's en well enough to walk around, and he certainly wasn't said he wasn't going to miss this thing. And That's great. He also met the uh, a couple of, well, fellow Lametta, the guy that I told you about, the one that yeah. had, he still has that piece of metal yeah. in his shoulder. And uh, Rich, um, as you look back on your military service and and your life after the service, um, did your experience in the service, how did it affect the rest of your life, the rest of what you did? Do you, you know what I mean? Were there, were there lessons learned that you carry through the rest oh, yeah. of your life? Well, it certainly made a man of me, I think. Uh, I think it's... it's uh, teaches you dis discipline for one and respect for others uh, of course you get angry and so on like everybody does but you always think that you know it could be a worse situation you know? and I, I I've always I wouldn't do it any 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 other way um, I'm out of questions I'm out of questions. Anything else you want to add that you want to share with people that will look at this videotape in the future? Thoughts about your service? I don't know. I, I think what I've said so far is, uh, I think it's enough right there. I, I, I can't, it's what I, the experiences that I had in my lifetime and I, uh, I look back, I was scared at many, many times, but uh, as I said, I think it makes a better man of you. And if I had to do it over again, I'd do it the same way. Well, Rich, we appreciate your service to the country, and we certainly appreciate your time to do this interview. Thanks. And I thank you. Did he do a